Well, good evening, everyone. My name is Julie Mickleberry, and I'm the Programs Director for Alumni Affairs. Um, on behalf of the Alumni Affairs team, welcome to our virtual edition of Profs at the Pub. Um, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, Profs at the Pub is a free speaker series for local alumni, faculty, staff, and the greater community. Um, while we're currently running the show in the virtual environment, um, we're hoping to get back out to some of our favorite watering holes um, in the new year. Um, today, we're joined in the audience um, by our interim executive director, Samantha Putnam, and associate director of campus partnerships and communications, Soleil Midas, um, UCSB Alumni Association board directors, uh, Leslie Klonoff and Tim Malone, and of course, our Gaucho community. Um, thank you all for joining us this evening. Um, just a quick um, reminder, just a couple of housekeeping items. Um, the session is being recorded and will be posted online for your viewing pleasure later. Um, everyone is on mute right now, but if you're comfortable, I'd encourage you to turn on your camera so we can create more of a communal kind of environment for our guest speaker. Um, during the presentation, I also want to encourage everyone to submit questions in the chat box and we'll do our best to get to those during Q&A. Um, now I'd like to in introduce Assistant Professor Stephanie Malia Holm, who will discuss Italy's response to COVID-19. In her talk, Teaching the Pandemic, Italy in the Age of Coronavirus, she will examine pressing concerns that, come, that came to the forefront during the pandemic, such as um, how the privilege of immobility intensified disparities and how politics intervened to value or not to value the life of one over another. Um, Professor Hom will explore the lessons learned from her course, The Pandemic, and the, resili the resilience of Italy and Italians, and of course, UCSB students more than one year later. Professor Hom lectures on modern Italy's colonialism, migration, and tourism history. In addition to her lectures, she is the author of Empire's Mobius Strip, Historical Echoes in Italy's Crisis of Migration and Detention, and the beautiful country, tourism, and the impossible state of destination Italy. Welcome, Professor Hong. Thank you so much, Julie. Um, thank you. Welcome to all of you. Uh, and many thanks to the UCSB Alumni Association and Soleil, and especially to Julie for extending this wonderful invitation to me today. Um, I, this is an incredible opportunity to share my work with you and to share my experience of teaching the pandemic with the whole Gaucho community. So thank you for, for having me. Um, I especially like to thank a couple of the alumni who reached out to me in advance of this event. Um, I'm a relatively new faculty member at UCSB. This is my second year, uh, only my first year on campus though. So it made me feel very welcome. So thank you for that. Uh, my remarks today will center on the experience of the pandemic in Italy, and spe specifically the experience of teaching the pandemic to a group of 37 UCSB undergraduates last fall. I created a course called Biopolitics in Medical Humanities, Italy in the Age of the Coronavirus. My course examined the experience of the pandemic in Italy, which as we all know, was one of the first countries ravaged by the pandemic. It also took as its counterpoint our experience here in the US. We compared we con and contrasted to comprehend the transnational repercussions of the pandemic. And my course was structured around four themes, mobility, biopolitics, immunization, and resilience. I'm gonna talk about a few of those today. But really on a broader level, I intended for the course to help students as well as myself to process what we were all living through at the time and to provide a virtual space since we were all on Zoom where we could come together as a community to counteract the isolation and anxiety caused by months of social distancing and sheltering in place. And the course was designed really to speak to two new initiatives at UCSB. Uh, the first is the burgeoning medical humanities initiative in the College of the Humanities and Fine Arts. And the second is the, our new transnational Italian studies major, also in HFA uh, in the Department of French and Italian. So I'm just gonna share my screen now. Um, here we go, if you can let me know if you can see, if you can see the slides. Okay, great. So the medical, just uh, 
quickly wanted to share the Medical Humanities Initiative is a program that aims to give students interested into going into healthcare the critical thinking skills they will need not only to succeed in the field, but also to thrive. Uh, a background in the humanities enriches the training of future healthcare professionals by introducing them to critical approaches to narrative, representation, ethics, culture, language, and more, all of which doctors and nurses and healthcare administrators, for instance, have to encounter uh, in microcosm in every, uh, almost every day. So having that humanities lens enables healthcare professionals to communicate with patients on a human level and in turn to build trust between patients and physicians and patients and healthcare professionals, which the research has shown is crucial for better healthcare outcomes. So I've just clipped the website here of the new Medical Humanities Initiative. Um, so you can take check that out. Um, the next thing is that my course was part of our new major in transnational Italian studies. Uh, this is the first of its kind in the US. UCSB is the first university to be offering this, um, uh, as far as I know, not only in the US, but around the world. So we really are on the cutting edge. Uh, the premise of the major and of the field is that Italy, like any nation state, cannot be studied in isolation. Its culture, its politics, its history has always been tied to other cultures, politics, and histories. In other words, its identity has never been bounded by national borders. And therefore, with our major, we're taking the study of Italy beyond borders. And that's what we mean by transnational. So for example, Italy uh, in Italian culture has always been strongly influenced by Italian American culture over the last two centuries. The circuits and networks of people, goods, and ideas are constantly in a state of exchange. Tourism is another example, and this is one of my research specializations. Today, more people visit Italy, um, I say that in quotes, say in the form of the Venetian Hotel in Las Vegas, than going to Italy itself. Or they experience Italian culture in places like the Olive Garden, rather than going to eat in Italy. So in transnational Italian studies, we ask how these experiences of Italy, whether it's at the Venetian or at the Olive Garden, uh, or through migration and colonialism and tourism, how are these experiences that are disconnected from national territory impact our global understandings of Italian language, history, and culture? And that's the premise of our major. So again, my course, which was called Biopolitics and Medical Humanities, Italy in the Age of the Coronavirus, and I taught last fall. Uh, this is a shot, a screenshot of, <laughs> of my students uh, in the course. This is what, how we interacted all quarter on Zoom. Um, we took this transnational orientation as our premise. And as we've all learned living through the pandemic, the coronavirus knows no national borders. Um, it was truly, it was and is truly a global phenomenon, a phenomenon that was made more intense by the world's interconnected and high speed mobilities. So unlike the Spanish flu in 1918, the SARS-CoV-2 virus spread around the world within days, thanks to our circuits of global air travel, our networks of highways and railroads, and our interwoven skein of innumerable shipping lanes. Yet for all the world's hypermobility, our, our first counter, our best defense against the virus, our first strategy was immobilization. I, mean, I think we all remember the stay at home orders, sheltering in place. Um, and it was this aspect of immobility, of immobilization that really caught my attention. I've spent years researching mobility. Don't you think she's pretty? Yeah. And um, specifically, I've spent years researching the differences between those who can move by choice, like tourists, and those who are moved by force, like migrants and refugees. The fundamental question is that I ask in my research is if to move is to live, then what kind of movement? makes for what kind of life? 
And here I just put some uh, some stats up. So this is a the cover of my second book, Empire's Mobius Strip, where I'm looking at the uh, the current migration crisis in the Mediterranean, how strategies of containment and uh, exclusion and segregation have roots uh, in Italy's colonial project in the early 20th century. And I argue that the control of mobility was at the center of colonial power. And I also show how these strategies of immobilization and containment and isolation have been carried forward into the present day in the current crisis of migration. But I, I put some stats up here just to show you this difference between those who move by choice and those who are moved by force and how um, the UN, UN Tour, World Tourism Agency uh, organization, the WTO, in 2019, there were 1.5 billion tourist arrivals. That is 1.5 billion people who are able to move by choice. Um, that dropped significantly during the pandemic uh, in 2020, and the numbers are steadily climbing back up. The UN Refugee Agency in 2019, there was 79.5 million forcibly displaced people. That number didn't drop, it grew during the pandemic. It grew during the pandemic. So this is the kind of dichotomy that I study between those who move by force and those who are moved move by choice and those who are moved by force. And I've spent years writing about those who are mobile as being extremely privileged, as belonging to a class of global elites who can move seamlessly across borders because they have the right passports, they come from the right country and they have the right amount of capital. Those who are not able to move so freely like refugees and asylum seekers, um, they, because they hold the wrong passport or they come from the wrong countries and they move in the wrong ways, they're not free to move, but yet they are, instead they are immobilized in places like migrant detention centers and third country holding areas in smugglers houses. So there's this sense that being able to move is a privilege and that being immobilized if you are trying to move in the wrong way um, is, is the vast uh, majority, as you can see here, forcibly displaced people are being immobilized in one place. In the scholarship uh, and mobilities research, we call this mobility generated inequality. So it was much to my surprise then to see how quickly this mobility generated inequality turned on a dime during the pandemic. If you recall those first stay at home orders that would help us flatten the curve, it was those who were privileged enough who could immobilize and stay at home. Immobil immobility, immobilization became, um, became what, was, what was valuable, became the source of privilege. Those who could not immobilize, those who had to move for work and who had jobs that necessitated their physical presence on site. These became essential workers. This was grocery stores, gas stations. We remember this from the beginning of the pandemic. In the course of our, during my course, we had a very, very interesting discussion about uh, essential workers and what that means because many of the students were working at the same time and they were considered essential workers. So they would come to class on Zoom and then they would go work um, often in a grocery store or in a, in a medical office. Um, and here was the same, the same debate was happening in Italy at the same time. This is a, a strike in Bologna uh, of the bicycle delivery uh, people who would deliver food um, to houses that they wanted the same kind of rights and um, privileges for those who can immobilize. Um, here, I just wanted to show a couple of slides. There we go. No more deliveries without, without rights is what this sign says. Uh, and I remember in our discussion, our students were saying that this designation of being a hero just went too far uh, for them because um, the essential worker as hero, uh, you know, didn't last very long and essentially, you know, behavior returned to, 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 to normal uh, in some ways after that. So what was interesting now for me, um, speaking about mobility and immobility, 
is the way that both can be activated to exercise privilege and therefore reify inequality. For the class of global elites who were hypermobile before the pandemic, if one had the means, one could now travel, um, or if one so, so chooses, they can also stay at home and telecommute. So it is now the control of both mobility and immobility that delineates power and privilege. And we really saw this um, set into relief by the pandemic. It's no longer just controlling mobility, but both mobility and immobility. So mobility and immobility were one part of the chorus. And the next part was about biopolitics. Um, biopolitics is defined as the sphere wherein politics intervenes in biological life. Uh, we drew on works from French philosopher Michel Foucault, maybe some of you have studied, read him when you were at UCSB, and it, especially an Italian philosopher named Giorgio Agamben, and another Italian philosopher named Roberto Esposito, who writes about immunization. And in the course, we discussed the two fundamental questions of biopolitics. What is the value of life? and who or what has the power to value life. And I should also say, we discussed what is the value and the non-value of a life, or who has the power to value and devalue life. So we're always looking at the back and forth, value, non-value, to value and to devalue. One of the most obvious examples that we discussed in relation to these questions were the decisions that doctors had to make about who would get care. In Italy, at the beginning of the crisis, there were not enough hospital beds or staff to care for patients, and doctors were forced to triage. It was a dark harbinger of what was to come in New York just a few weeks later. And then as the pandemic wore on, the surges that occurred again and again, and especially over the last summer with the Delta variant. It is a doctor's charge to do no harm, but then how does one discern what harm might be? These are the questions debated in the realm of bioethics, yes, but also uh, and especially in the realm of philosophy. We discussed at length the recentering of life as the primary charge of politics and thus the primary charge of government. This is a fundamental shift that happened in the 17th century, according to Michel Foucault. Uh, for millennia, he writes, man remained what he was for Aristotle, a living animal with the additional capacity for political existence. But modern man, and I'm using that as Foucault did, modern man is an animal whose politics places his existence as a living being into question. If one places one's existence as a living being into question, if the politics place existence into question, then it raises questions like, and this is what we debated in the course, when does life begin and when does life end? We, we see this in the news today with the, the law surrounding uh, abortion in Texas. Um, this has been the subject of innumerable, it's still ongoing legal battles right now. Um, when does life begin? When does life end? This has also been the subject of innumerable uh, legal battles too. Uh, and again, who has the power to make these decisions? What is the value of life? Looking at value as a noun, what is the worth of a life? And then how do you value life? This is the ethical question. And then the question I posed to the students was, is there a point at which life no longer has value? That is life that is not worth saving or living. And how do you know? How do you know that point? So, of course, this led to a lot of different uh, debates and discussions, and I'm happy to take this up in the, in the Q&A, but I wanted to share one of the last points of the course, um, the last movement of the course, is we talked about resilience and how has the pandemic transformed us and how do we give meaning to our experience? We began this portion of the course by discussing grief and grieving for the scale of loss on so many levels throughout this pandemic is still incomprehensible to us. I mean, we just surpassed the 5 million deaths worldwide and 750,000 here in the United States. 
And we know that these estimates are likely to be undercounts. In our course, uh, we discuss the five stages of grief outlined by Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, denial, anger, bargaining, sadness, acceptance. But more importantly, we also discussed the sixth stage of grief, which is finding or making meaning. This stage was added just a few years ago by David Kessler, who was Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's prote longtime protege, who worked with her on a number of these publications. And in this sense, how do we find meaning in the pandemic? What have we learned and how have we been transformed? In Italy, there was a sense of trying to make meaning by forging deeper community ties during the pandemic. And this is one of the lessons we can glean from Italy, um, that the pandemic helped to forge deeper ties uh, within communities. The countrywide effort, um, uh, you know, some of you might remember the countrywide effort that people came together every evening and sang on balconies. Um, and in 2021, there really was a sense of coming together, not only on the level of a national community, but also as a country uh, in relation to victories in things like the Eurovision Song Contest, a contest that was founded after World War II precisely to bring European countries together in peace after war had devastated the continent. Uh, it was brought together by gold medal winning performances uh, by, in the Tokyo Olympics. And most importantly uh, for the country, the victory in the European Soccer Championship, the 2020 UEFA Cup. Um, similarly, UCSB students made meaning out of the pandemic by forging deeper ties with their families and their communities, including our university. In their final projects, I asked them to reflect together on their experiences of the coronavirus pandemic. What were your high points? What were your low points? How have you changed over the last few months? And building on these reflections, they were asked to develop and share a creative project that expresses for them the transformative power of the pandemic and that which has helped them to find meaning in the experience. And I just wanted to share a few of those projects with you today. So one of them here, uh, one group created a storytelling website in which they all documented how they found meaning in loss. And so this was, um, uh, you can hit click on that link there. Another uh, created an interactive art exhibit where you would walk through and each student of this group had created, um, had isolated, had singled out a part of the pandemic that they kind of dove deep into and really um, contemplated and asked how that part, so this person, Caitlin, asked how the politicization, politicization of the virus uh, really changed her perspective on things. It helped her to make meaning of her own identity in relation to everyone else throughout the pandemic. And last, I wanna show you this video that was made by the students. It's called Positives in a Pandemic. And I'm gonna hit play here. One word I would use to describe the pandemic is chaotic, stressful, horrible, pretty boring, divisive, stress. Monotonous, unpredictable, not knowing what next week is going to look like, navigating just life, work, knowing that it's out there is a little scary. I don't know, every single day is kind of the same, they all blur together. Every day we hear different stories and there's different headlines, so we're just very much out of the loop in so many things, I think. <laughs> A positive thing that came out of the pandemic was just like the gratitude I gained from realizing all the things I take for granted. I've definitely taken the time during the pandemic to focus on my health, both mentally and physically. I really enjoyed the virtual teaching I have. It uh, has given me much better hours, more time to spend at home with my family and animals access to these crazy cool resources um, are available to a lot more people that may have never gotten that opportunity before. During the pandemic I learned to appreciate my time with like family and friends and I don't think a lot of people 
before the pandemic appreciated that time at all. For me, people have definitely um, started to value life and family and friends a lot more in like strengthening of relationships. And I think that that has changed for the better. Even if they're not the same as they would be like during a normal school year, at least I'll have this year that like a lot of good came out of it, even during like a hard time. One, one word I would use to describe. And that is it for my portion of this talk. Thank you very much. And I look forward to hearing your questions. Let's see. All right, we have a comment. I'll go ahead and just read straight from the chat from Jane. Um, she says, this has been so interesting, Stephanie, thank you. I love the questions that you pose to your students about what helped them find meaning in the pandemic and wonder if you had the chance to ask the same of Italian students. Yeah, you know, uh, Jane, I have not yet had that opportunity. Thank you for the question. Um, but I will say that, um, Next on the horizon, the next course that I'm teaching in the winter is a course in Italian, and it's called Scritture Pandemiche, or Pandemic Writings, because over the last year, there have been a whole swath of books that have been published in Italy. They are diaries, uh, pandemic diaries, they are letters, um, there's been an incredible burst of creative activity. So um, my student, the students and I next quarter will be analyzing these writings and translating. They have not yet been translated them into English. And you know, we'll be doing translating in terms of language, but also translation in terms of culture as well. And this is, we're a year later from when I taught this course uh, last fall. And I'm curious to see where uh, students are at UCSB um, and in, one year since the since since we first taught that other course. That's great. Um, and so I'm going to share a question that you received before we hopped on um, our Zoom, and that was from Soleil, and she was asking me how you decided to teach Italian studies. So I don't know if you want to share sort of. Sure, you know, sure. Yeah. So. My career path is 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 long and, and circuitous, but I have um, I, I came to Italian studies from a background in international relations. So in college, I studied political science. The nation state was always at the heart of my my work. I did study Italian and German in college, and studied abroad in Vienna and Austria. And um, after college, I, I ended up getting a job um, like, like uh, as, a, as a reporter for a daily newspaper in Colorado. And it just so happened that the uh, Italian national ski team was practicing in the ski area next to my office and my editor sent me out to, to interview them. And I did, I, it was the, the years of Alberto Tomba, if anyone remembers, uh, Tomba La Bomba, his world champion back in the day. And I ended up doing the entire interview in Italian and the uh, academic, uh, the provost of the local community college system had heard I had done this and they'd been wanting to have an Italian course there for a long time. And they asked me to teach a course in conversational Italian. So uh, that's what I did. And as I was teaching, I thought, you know, this is something I could really do for the rest of my life. And that was the impetus for me to, um, first moved to Italy and I got the equivalent of a high school diploma in Italian. And at the same time was still working as a freelance journalist while living there and then returned to the States to go to graduate school at UC Berkeley. So um, that was how I, I came into the field. Thanks, Soleil. That's great. It's, it's it's wonderful when you can find your passion and kind of continue that out and make it a, a career. So mm -hmm. um, thank you for that. Um, had a question in the chat, whether or not the recording will be available post um, discussion. Absolutely. We're gonna be posting the full recording on the website um, in the next uh, couple of weeks. So I know that a few of you had some trouble logging on tonight. Sorry for that. Um, but yes, it will be available. Um, so I have, as you're all thinking about your more questions for Professor Hom, 
Um, I will ask another. Um, I know that the the media played an enormous role um, in the spread of misinformation um, in the United States. So I'm wondering if you could share a little bit about how um, the media um, impacted um, the response and resiliency in Italy. Now that is a great question. And we, we did an entire uh, segment on the infodemic that was happening at the same time as the pandemic, which is the spread of not only misinformation, but disinformation, that is the, the active uh, creation of bad information. Um, and in Italy, there was a parallel phenomenon, but not necessarily to the same degree. So there were, uh, they were called um, negazioni, negazionisti, negationists, people who didn't believe the virus existed. There is also a segment of anti-mascherinisti, uh, anti-maskers. And there is actually a segment of anti-vaccinisti, anti-vaxxers in Italy as well, but not to the same extent here. What we saw with the, the infodemic and the mis and disinformation in Italy um, was really related to the right-wing party of Matteo Salvini, who is was the, I think it was at the time he was deputy uh, minister of the minister of the interior, actually. And this is a person who, if anyone knows anything about Italian politics, he belonged to the League Party, the Lega Party. It was formerly called the Lega Nord. This is um, one of the furthest right-wing, uh, xenophobic, racist, um, incredibly political parties um, that has centered in Northern Italy. For a long time, uh, this party's platform was centered on seceding from the Italian nation state and creating its own country called Padania. But uh, in much in the same way that the right has come to power in the US, it has these, these sort of populist movements have come to par power across Europe as well. And Salvini's party uh, represented that in Italy. And it was the, that was where it was through that party, through tweets. Often Salvini would simply retweet things that Trump uh, would say, and that would get circulated. So. The, there was this, this transnational aspect to the circulation of mis and disinformation as well, um, occurring mostly through, through the right of the Italian political establishment. So uh, I hope that answers your question. Julie. No, it really does. Thank you. Thank you. Um, softball question here. Um, I've never been to Italy, but I'm sure that you have. What is your favorite uh, place to visit in Italy? Oh, that is that is a very good question and a very difficult question because I have many favorite places to visit in Italy. And I will say, you know, when I was working on my first book, my first book is all about tourism. And, you know, I had to go and be a tourist. Um, so I had the, the opportunity to spend a summer in Venice. And what I was doing in Venice was I was following groups of American tourists and groups of Italian tourists and comparing and contrasting their differing experiences of the city. And they were very different for the most part. Um, but the place, the city that I know best is Rome because I've lived there uh, for almost three years all told. So uh, it's a city of, of contrast, a city that, that keeps on giving. Uh, it's the center of, it's kind of the beating heart of, of Italy. Um, it's old and new, uh, light and dark. You know, it's really the city of chiaroscuro. And um, so that would be my, my first recommendation to anybody who, would, who is going to Italy. Thank you. I will definitely make note of that. So, well, um, last call for questions for the professor. Um, and if we don't have any um, more, then I'll just give you the opportunity to give a final thought um, and then I'll make a few announcements. Sure. Well, in, in, in let's see. I think there is, a, I saw one more question. We do have one more question that just came in. Yes. Um, so you talked some about resilience and grief. Um, I'm imagining there may be greater familiar support systems and other rituals to help Italians cope with grief compared to the US. Um, what other mental health supports are available there? 
great question. That is a great, great question. Thank you, Carrie. Um, the, I agree that there's a greater familial support system. Um, it's much more common to find extended families living close together, not necessarily in the same roof, but certainly in the same town. Um, so that has really helped, you know, forge the sense of community, not just, I wouldn't say forge, but to reinforce the sense of community that was already existing there. Um, mental health is, is an issue too in Italy. Um, in the 70s, not unlike here in, in the US, um, state-run mental health um, asylums were all closed down. So that there was a gaping, there's a, there still is a gaping hole uh, in the public health system. There, uh, Italy's public health system is much more robust than ours here in the United States. And I think you find uh, mental health support more often through private clinics and private hospitals. Um, what was very interesting in, the, in our course, we did a segment where the outbreak happened in Northern Italy. It's very interesting, this, this part, this region of the country has the highest degree of uh, public and private hospitals. Um, so there's about 50-50 you know, mix where for the rest of the country, it's predominantly public run hospitals and healthcare. And so we had um, some, uh, just the outbreak was uh, was very difficult to manage from the beginning, but I think also having the private and the public uh, side by side there also contribute to some degree to this difficulty of management. But I think um, both Italy and the US, we are going to have to, we're kind of coming to a place where there's going to be an incredible amount of grief that for not just the two countries, but the world, uh, we lost 5 million people, incredible amount of grief that we haven't even begun looking at yet. Was the first stage of grief is denial. And I think we're, we're all kind of still there because in many parts of this country, um, you know, if you're, if you're reading the news today, there, we're still in the middle of a surge in many states and um, hospitals are triaging care. Uh, hospitals are on crisis protocols. And so um, mental health is, is certainly the next, uh, you know, pandemic in, in some ways. And it, in the course, it was definitely uh, something that the students were very, very interested in. And one of the assignments we did at UCSB as part of the support, if you remember last uh, fall, gave all students and faculty and staff access to a meditation app. Uh, it was Aura. And uh, I actually assigned the students to do a week of meditation and see how, and to journal about it and see how they changed in that last part of the course on resilience. And um, they were, you know, the ones who did actually do it were really positive. They said, I didn't know that even five minutes a day with this app could really shift the way that I was feeling. So I think something as little as that, and again, it's a credit to the university and student service and whoever came up with that idea for the well, for the meditation app, really was a great support uh, at the beginning of the pandemic. That's amazing. I think that's really um, says a lot about your investment in the well-being of your students to sort of just kind of give them that nudge and kind of make it a requirement, <laughs> just give it a try <laughs> because it is so helpful and self-care is so important. So, well, it has been a delight um, talking with you tonight. Um, I wanna thank you so much for gener generously sharing um, your time and your insights and your expertise with us this evening. Um, so thank you so much. Um, and I'm just gonna give a few reminders before we wrap up for the evening. Um, one, we really value everyone's feedback and I'm gonna be sharing a survey um, along with the follow-up email. So keep a lookout for that. Um, I also want to encourage everyone, um, especially the alumni out there, um, to join our professional uh, networking site, Gacho Network. Um, in this time of still virtual programming, it's a great way to stay connected mm -hmm. with your community. Um, our next <coughs> hub will, 
apologies for the barking dog in the background. Um, uh, the next Prof of the Pub will be um, scheduled probably in February, so stay tuned for the solid date for that. Um, and then, of course, alumni is proud to be um, sponsoring the Greek Interconnect event that's happening on Saturday. Um, it's plastered all over our website and social media sites, so if you haven't signed up for that and you happen to be a part of the Greek system, please join us for some professional development and lessons on how to build your brand. So um, thank you so much for joining us, Professor Hom, for all of the gauchos out there. Um, I hope you have a wonderful evening. <laughs>